Yes, sir. Yeah. We're able to share it? Yeah, only the camera, I think. Your sharing is done. I mean, projection and uh, this thing only. Uh -huh. You are able to share the screen, no? Yeah, yeah. That should be okay. That's okay. You are not able to see the people who are uh, speaking. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter. We'll go ahead without it. Yeah. So the audio will go, no? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. The series of Foundation Day lectures started up to the 50 years of IAA, 2021-22. Can everyone hear me? No. Okay. So we have had so far two lectures, two Foundation Day lectures, and the third lecture we are hosting it here in Kodaikanal on the occasion of the 125th anniversary of the observatory. Uh, so the third Foundation Day lecture uh, we have Sri Kiran Kumar, a joint government chair. I invite Professor Anapurni Subramaniam to introduce the speaker. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third IA Foundation lecture. Uh, the, uh, so we have uh, uh, Sri uh, Kiran Kumar Sarvitas, he is the chair. On the Council of IA, and uh, I don't think uh, she can come on request any introduction as such, but uh, 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 just for the sake of completing the formality, just for sake uh, for the sake of formality, I completed. So she uh, Kiran Kumar uh, is a distinguished figure in the field of space science and technology. He served as secretary of the Department of S uh, Space and Chairman of Indian Space. Organization from 2015 to 2018 with a master's degree and the Lemtech and Physical Engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He has been instrumental in steering India's space program towards application oriented endeavors. This has led to significant advances in areas such as earth observation, communication, navigation, meteorology, and space science. Sri Kiran Kumar's contributions include the design and development of over 50 electro-optical imaging sensors for space-borne platforms as well as his pivotal role in missions like Chandrayaan-1 and the Mars Orbiter mission. He has chaired esteemed committees and received numerous accolades, including the Padma Shri in 2014 and the Chevalier or uh, sorry, or the National Villa. Legion the honor by the French Department the government of France in 2019. I'm sorry for the pronunciation, but this is indeed a great honor from the Department of France in 2019. So we are very fortunate to have uh, Sri Kiran Kumar delivering the Foundation Day lecture, and we are, it's very special for us because it is as part of the uh, 125 year birthday of the Kodakana Observatory as well. Welcome, sir, and request you to uh, give the talk. Good evening to all of you, and uh, it's indeed a great privilege and honor to be part of this uh, 125th anniversary of uh, Kodaikana, and also the opportunity to speak in the Foundation Day lecture. So what I thought is in the Foundation Day lecture, and anyway as part of 125th anniversary, you will be hearing a lot about the activities here. So I thought we'll go to a different domain and then link some of the things, how they are linked and connected. So what I intend to do is take you through the journey of Indian space program, how it started and where we are today. So probably we are all very familiar when the first object was put into orbit by Russians way back in 1957. The two superpowers were really trying to compete with each other and demonstrate who is more mightier and powerful. India was a fledgling democracy, just 10 years into independence, struggling to provide food, shelter, and education to its citizens. So at that time, we had great visionary people like Homi Baba and Dr. Sarabhai who were looking at how this disruptive technology of going beyond that can be used in our country's development. 
and what Dr. Sarabhai said at that time is, while we make use of this technology, we need to be second to none and to address the real problems of man and society. And also, to assure its development, India views science and space technology as a crucial apparatus for its socio-economic development. And like I said, it was in the 1957, 4th of October, when the first object went into space. And that time, what Dr. Sarabhai could do was convince his friends across America, France, Germany, and Russia. Tell them that we have a unique place in, in Trivandrum, and where we have a geomagnetic equator. And if you do upper atmospheric research there, the scientific community will benefit. With that in mind, he could get sounding rockets in the form of kits, got it assembled in that dilapidated church, what you are seeing. And then there's also another story which we'll touch upon subsequently. Starting from that place where the first sounding rockets were assembled, then the whole process of India's journey into space started and gradually it moved further. So one of the first things that was done in the country was we had how to bring in effective communication and broadcasting and information to its citizens. If you can, in 1975, India conducted the world's largest socio-technological experiment. At a time when only four metros had the privilege of seeing television channels, ISRO conducted in 2,400 remote villages using a technology which is very similar to today's direct-to-home television. That what was done is direct to community sets. The advanced satellite that was built by Americans was borrowed, moved over the Indian longitude, and you can see a 10-foot chicken mesh antenna and the black and white television sets of ECIL and with almost a rack, half rack size equipment hosting the direct to community television observation system. Those were all built in the country. And through this process, it was shown to the country that the alternate way of bringing in communication and broadcasting is possible compared to the technology that existed at that time. Every one kilometer you had to put a microwave tower if you had to cover the three and a quarter million square kilometers of India. You need to appreciate not only the amount of money you have to spend, the effort, and the unreachability of a large area would have caused problem. But then, from the satellite, geostationary satellite, one third of the globe is visible directly. Line of sight communication is possible. So that's how, from 80s onwards, the communication and broadcasting activity became very prevalent. And another very important thing was, super cyclones used to kill tens of thousands of people's lives. And at that time, what was done is using satellite-based observations of the cloud, motion of the cloud, cloud motion vectors, and then providing that information to the weather modeling, you could identify the occurrence of cyclone. And today, the capability is you can tell where the cyclone comes and where it reaches well in advance. And as a result of that, disaster relief agencies can actually evacuate people there and save their lives. Just a few days back, we had one of the INSAT 3DS which was launched, which is almost a third generation satellite, which provides every 15 minutes images in six different wavelengths and also a vertical and temperature humidity profile. All this data goes into the numerical weather forecasting model and then it is on this basis that you are able to not only get the cyclones and super cyclone information, but also a host of information which is going for the agricultural, both in terms of their planning and monitoring. Are they able to see the thing? Yes. Okay. So then similarly, the ability to use the space both for communication and broadcasting was also used for space uh, telemedicine and teleeducation to recent COVID times you have seen how this proliferated both in terms of terrestrial technology. But long back, India had shown that remote places like Andaman, Nicobar, the patients can be linked to super specialty hospitals through the satellite links that were there. 
and also conducting remote classrooms with in tele-education. So these were all possible using the space-based systems that were done. Another very interesting story which uh, I need, I want to mention is about the fishermen. So when Professor Sarabhai had to conduct the first sounding rocket experiment in Tumba, he had to convince the fishermen of that region with the help of the Bishop Peter Bernard Pereira, telling the fishermen, you vacate this place for us to conduct this sounding rocket experiment, one day the country will benefit. So he had to actually make use of the bishop's help in convincing the fishermen. And just as though what he had promised, what was possible to be done is, 1999 onwards, we were able to provide by looking at the color of the ocean from orbiting satellites in eight different wavelengths, through that identify the chlorophyll and from the chlorophyll through the food chain of the fish, where in the ocean fisherman is assured of fish catch called prospective fishing zone. This information was being disseminated by the Indian National the Ocean Information System Hyderabad from 99 onwards. In fact, just this task alone of providing information to almost lakhs of fishermen across our seven and a half thousand kilometer long coastline saves to the country between 10 to 15 thousand crores a year because the amount of petrol and diesel the fishermen save in directly reaching the prospective fishing point, they don't have to search, it happens. And another thing that has happened subsequently is we have today our own navigation satellite. This navigation satellite, what it does is any small gadget you hold, you know the, your latitude and longitude. Now, in the boat of the fisherman, a battery operated gadget is fitted and this gadget receives the signal from our Navic satellite. Not only it locates itself in terms of latitude, longitude, but also it gets the messages which is broadcasting what is the prospective fishing zone latitude, longitude. Then a mobile in the hands of the fisherman the mobile does not have any connectivity to terrestrial tower because once you go a few hundred or few kilometers away from any terrestrial tower, no communication is possible with your mobile. But then this mobile communicates with the gadget fitted in the boat. An app in the mobile enables the fisherman to see in a video compass mode where he has to go for his fishing. Not only that, in his mother tongue, he gets alert about if the coming days weather is going to be unbearable, it's going to be cyclonic or even sea state roughness is going to be unbearable. And also many times we have read in the papers, our neighboring countries capture the fishermen because they wade into their waters. And this gadget alerts the fishermen in his mother tongue about the crossing of the international boundary. So you can see here what is happening. A person who does not know reading or writing is getting the advantage of the most advanced technology of a rocket putting the satellite into the orbit and its application reaching to him and making, he's able to make his livelihood assured of fish catch, etc. So in fact, this is a very good example of how what Dr. Sarabhai and others envisioned how space technology can be used. One of the key examples is in this. And of course, uh, a whole lot of things have happened beyond that. Today, actually, the, there are three companies which have been given contract for manufacturing these gadgets and state governments are actually going to provide these gadgets to the fishermen in those states so that their livelihood, there is an improvement. And also, the next generation of uh, sending the message from where he has captured the fish, a photograph of this fish capture comes to the market and he is assured of even purchase before he reaches the market. So that's the way things are moving. So other thing was, apart from communication, we built our own navigation satellites. Navigation satellites also what we did was quite significantly different from what others have done. While globally, people like Americans, Russians, Chinese and Europeans built a 24 to 32 satellite constellation, we were able to do with only seven satellites because our prime objective was to provide the capability only the beyond the boundaries of India. You slightly bear with me because the window is not occupying full. 
There are small hitches here. communication satellite the what the way it was started is we got the initial set of satellites built by american company but then from 1980 onwards we have been continuously improving our ability and a host of communication satellites operating in different wavelengths is providing data broadcasting telecommunication telemedicine and a host of other applications and then today one of the thing that's happening is by making use of the data collected from satellites in different uh, wavelengths and as you can see once you are in orbit there are no boundaries state boundaries or national boundaries you can cover the entire globe and then you can see what's happening in the globe not only in the the region in which our eye can see but also the entire electromagnetic spectrum and a host of such instruments covering visible microwave infrared and multi spatial and multi temporal resolutions are generated and navigation also gives us the positioning information and using that the all these models are created for providing various applications and this data is provided to many different institutions in the country one of the thing that happens is it's quite easy to technologically bring in some new information but then to make that information effectively used by the user community is also a task and requires persistent effort so here we found that while there were early adopters of technology there were others who required constant prodding and a lot of uh, convincing before they took up while ministry of uh, forestry started biennial forest mapping data similarly meteorology department started using the data for visual observation but only much later they started using it for actually modeling and then providing effective information to the agricultural community airports authority of india and similarly crop forecasting it took almost 3 decades before mahalanobis crop forecasting center was established in delhi by the ministry and then here again you see how people matter in various things while somebody comes to us and tell us what you are doing can be done very differently with a new technology first reaction would be i know my job better who are you to tell me but then if they keep persisting then we realize that the new technology has so many advantages and here again the honorable prime minister was able to actually showcase to the secretaries of various state and central governments by telling them extempore on a two days at the end of a two day seminar he told them how each department can make use of the space technology for bringing in better services to the country and this event happened in 2015 and then lot more went up and then again in the technology area you need to appreciate that lot of progress has happened elsewhere not only you need to learn and build your capability but also you need to work with others and take advantage of that and we work with french for megatropics where using microwave based humidity sounders we were able to provide information to our weather forecasting model similarly another instrument called saral which actually tells us about sea state um, sea surface heights 
measurements to centimeter accuracy. And then we ourselves provided to South Asian region as through a satellite called South Asia Satellite, where the transponder was provided free to our neighboring countries. So here again, you can see how as the country's capability evolves, the, the governance also change, looks at changes in the approach. How space has become a diplomacy tool. The Honorable Prime Minister announced that we will provide these uh, transponders free of cost to our neighboring countries. And on the day this launch took place, he had also brought together all the heads of states. What the Afghanistan president told at that time is worth recalling. <coughs> Afghanistan president in, said in that uh, program, see, we are used to people making promises, but I am seeing for the first time a promise made being fulfilled in real quick time. So then within few years of what was promised in SAR, India was able to provide this service to the neighboring countries. <coughs> then, of course, uh, this slide shows taking pictures from the satellite. We started with imaging something like 340 kilometers by 340 kilometer in one frame with a one kilometer resolution. Starting from that, gradually we moved. Today, we are able to generate 30 centimeter resolution, multispectral and also hyperspectral image. You can see from geostationary platforms, every few seconds some different resolutions and then not only in visible and uh, infrared but you can also do in many other wavelength regions including microwave so the meteorological satellite first generation was all brought from american company but then subsequently all of that we are building and today we have a host of such satellites providing data similarly hyperspectral imaging again you can see that the amount of information you can extract about an object depends on in how many wavelengths and how narrow a band you are operating. You can correlate different features. In fact, for the crop, you can find out whether the crop vigor, crop whether it is infested or affected by certain actually insects, etc. All that is possible using hyperspectral imagery. Similarly, like glass is transparent to us. In the microwave region, clouds are transparent because you can imagine during the June to September region, India is full of clouds. So what can you see from space it can be a question. But then if you are operating in microwave region, it can penetrate through the clouds and make observations. And we have a number of uh, such microwave sensor based observations, which is able to collect data. It can give about um, rice, it can give about jute coconut and sorry groundnut and many other such things and also this is also called what is called as an active sensor like when you take a picture from your mobile in the night you make use of flash so flash is an artificial source while during daytime using sunlight we can take images in the microwave region you carry your own source illuminate the object and based on that you are picking up the data so we have built such capabilities and this is also one of the recently a completed uh, satellite and these radar imaging satellites what they can also do is they can tell you about the surface deformations on the earth small deformation to the tune of few centimeters you can pick up and such uh, sensors are in operation today in fact it's actually our ability to bring such uh, this particular uh, video shows to you what has happened in the recent past of how data is being made available to the global means to the local as well as the global community oh sorry it's automatically happening okay so this actually just shows See, while initially there was a lot of uh, reluctance to provide data because of various uh, rules and regulations that existed, today the government of India has made it mandatory and up to 5 meters data is available to the entire public. In fact, you can easily download. And today among the world, this is the most highest resolution freely available data. Below 5 meters, it is still costed and made available for okay, 
so they think it's not playing for you. Maybe we'll skip and go ahead. Okay. okay. escape and do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's okay. Then. So well, a lot of these activities are happening. Uh, the space program was also always uh, looking at what can be done in space science ar arena. In the very first satellite also, if you look at 1975, Aryabhata, we had X-ray astronomy, aeronomy, and solar physics uh, related payloads. And then continuously development started happening. And then today you have AstroSat, and then you have uh, Aditya, and a host of them. And uh, for example, you can also see the observations that were made using AstroSat, Mars mission, etc. Where is visit of Red Planet? ISRO's first ever interplanetary mission Mangal Yan successfully visited Mars on its maiden voyage. On September 24, 2014, India garnered international recognition for successfully inserting the Mars Orbiter mission, MOM, into Mars orbit on the first try. Despite the fact that this feat has previously been accomplished by advanced space agencies multiple times over, it's the fourth country to reach Mars orbit. After leaving Earth, the spacecraft MOM covered 650 millions of kilometers in her 300-day journey to Mars. The success of the mission, in the words of Honorable Prime Minister, seven years of mission life despite being designed for six months. India's ability to send spacecraft into interplanetary space was demonstrated by this mission. So these are some of the results uh, which came from Mars missions. And then in AstroSat also, of course, the Again, one of the key things you need to appreciate is the telescopes that were built in this country, AstroSat, were actually built in uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Ayuka, and then Indian Institute of uh, the Raman Institute, etc. TIF, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And the development took almost 10 years, but at the end of that, what this satellite has done is some outstanding performance, and it's able to provide in a specific wavelength region in the far ultraviolet region, it has provided virgin data to our astronomers and scientists. And Aditya, of course, is another mission which is currently in operation. And then the coronagraph itself is going through the initial installation. Apart from that, all the remaining instruments have already started functioning and are generating extremely useful information on that. And then for doing all this, we had to go through a large number of development of different types of launch vehicles, indigenous launch vehicles, uh, both in terms of PSLV, cryogenic engine development. And not only did we put our own satellites into orbit, but we also put a large number of satellites for other countries. Operationalized after three developmental flights in 2019, LVM-3 is a geostationary launch vehicle of the third generation. The second operational flight is commercialized to an international customer, OneWeb, an indigenously developed 630-ton launch vehicle capable of placing payloads of up to 4 metric tons into geosynchronous orbit, GEO, and 6 metric tons into low Earth orbit, LEO. The vehicle has seven consecutively successful missions, handle, GEO, LEO, planetary missions, 
and commercialized in a short period of time. It's identified for Gaganyaan mission, writing a new chapter in India's space history. Yeah, of course, um, PSLV itself is known as a very versatile vehicle which is capable of putting multiple satellites into orbit and satellites into multiple orbits. And now another version is getting added to this capability, what is called as POEM, where the fourth stage is also being used for a large number of experiments, which will help us in completing, developing our space station related systems. So our low cost version of initial experimentation is happening with PSLV. So one of the things probably you need to appreciate in this is that this entire process of building the technological capability is when a new technology appears, there are early adopters and there are okay late adopters and laggards. And then another thing is the uh, how you adopt this technology depends on the ingenuity of the people. So what Sarabhai actually did in a way was in leapfrogging, and probably you will find this term used many times leapfrogging. So what is happening in that is effectively that all the energy what you have is conserved and what you want to achieve, you are doing. So right from the time sight was demonstrated, sight itself, though the world had the broadcasting capability, Americans had put the most advanced technology satellite, it was India's uh, system which demonstrated how this can be used in a very convincing way for reaching out to the large masses and this got a Marconi award at that time because it was the world's largest socio-technological experiment conduct. Similarly, in between, between 95 and 99, ISRO demonstrated in the civilian domain, we were able to adopt the technology of the C using CCDs and many compact telescope building where between this period, the world civilian domain saw highest resolution imaging generated from our systems. And as a result of that, we had almost 18 ground stations across the globe receiving this data. Similarly, in Mars Orbiter, you saw how a launch vehicle which had a limited capacity could be effectively used for taking an object to almost 600 million kilometers of distance and then orbit around the Mars. Similarly, in AstroSat, the ability to provide in far ultraviolet region what nobody else had received at that time and 104 satellites being launched. So all this shows that your ability to actually adopt makes a huge difference while whatever technology that is available to it you access but then you use it in a way which is necessary for solving your own problems and if you do that people definitely take note of you and then start working with you. In fact, one very good example of that is what is called as a NISAR program, NASA ISRO Synthetic Radar Program, where the most advanced technology, SWEEPSAR technology satellite is being built. Americans are spending one plus billion dollars. We are spending about 0.1, but it's a joint mission where the payload, which in which India also has a common segment, is being integrated with our rocket, we are launching it and the data will be made available to the global community. While we were working with Americans, there was a common mission came up only after we demonstrated Chandrayaan-1 and our own radar satellites. So then only they were ready to accept the technological capability. So what it shows is you need to demonstrate your capability before others can accept you for working together. And today, one of the things that's happening is, of course, human space program. While India was developing all these capabilities of launch vehicles, satellites, and various applications to address its problem, we grew from a very low position just after independence to the fifth largest economy. And in the coming years, we are aspiring to reach the topmost. If that has to happen, the role you play also needs to change. You need no longer need to look outside only for all the things to happen. So India also started looking at beyond the use of space technology. Space is becoming the fourth frontier where the human being is looking at how we can take advantage of our ability to go into space. And here, human presence in space 
and the ability to make use of the technological capability is going to play a very significant role. So the government initially announced by 75th year of our independence, we should have put our gaganauts into orbit and brought them back. But then because of COVID and other economic reasons, it got delayed. But then work is in progress full swing. And by next year, you will have our gaganauts going around Earth. But then world is moving so fast that the government has already decided that it's the, our human space program is not just for going around the orbit once. We want to land man, Indians on moon by 2040. So now if you look at, if you are going to land on moon by 2040, you have to build the whole lot of capability of space station and many such things towards that the work is going on. And these are some slides on that and this also A small video which shows. Honorable Prime Minister made the Gaganyan mission announcement. In the current setup for crew management, the crew module is recovered by parachutes after being dropped into the ocean. However, the wing body is a very successful technique of transporting the crew or payload to low Earth orbits and returning to Earth at a very low cost. ISRO conducted trials on a scaled-down prototype of a reusable launch vehicle to demonstrate hypersonic characterization, autonomous navigation, and controls in order to create the capability for this. New India reaffirms its capability in developing cutting-edge space technologies for space plane development. Prime Minister made the Gaganyan mission announcement. In the current setup... Okay, I think they will go ahead. So this was the NISAR experiment I was talking about. So this is going to provide a huge capability to the global scientific community because this is going to provide a very unique set data set where few millimeter changes on the Earth's surface which can run as precursor for seismic studies and also biomass estimation and cryosphere studies, a whole lot of application is expected to emerge from this and this is expected to get launched later this year. Maybe I'll just touch a little bit upon Chandrayaan, Chandrayaan 3. I'm sure one of the key things uh, probably you have noticed is the launch vehicle which we had built had a limited capability of putting up to two tons into low earth orbit and we made use of the, such a launch vehicle initially for going to moon and then with by that time our uh, launch vehicle LVM3 became available so we could carry a little more mass into the orbit and then the whole process of taking any object to a celestial body and making it orbit around that would require first take the object close to that particular celestial object moon is, which is about 380,000 kilometers so for reaching that place we did not have enough resources in our launch vehicle. So what was done is the satellite itself had its engines and using its capability, every time the satellite comes to the perigee point of an elliptical orbit, you add a small velocity to that, then its apogee point keeps going further and further. So by adding consecutively small amounts of energy, you are able to overcome the problem of a rocket directly putting the object with sufficient velocity. So this kind of an approach we adopted and today five missions we have already done. Three of the Chandrayaan mission, Mars mission and even Aditya mission. So you can say we have really perfected this art of uh, putting smaller weight objects reaching celestial bodies farther away. And this is again in some ways innovative approach of using within the resources what you have make do what you want to achieve you saw in that uh, high jumper if he doesn't have the space for generating enough momentum by running he has to crouch at one place and do single jump that's what the frog does and that is a leapfrogging technique so this is also an example of that similarly in chandrayaan 3 we also made use of 
some of the learning we did in Ch- we had in Chandrayaan two where certain failures occurred. We made use of the one of the key things probably you need to appreciate is till Chandrayaan one two we had built rocket engines, which the way it used to work is once you start that engine, it will start delivering fixed amount of force. That means from the beginning to end, it will operate with a fixed thrust. But when you want to descend and touch down safely or in a very low velocity, you need to compensate the gravity and also keep changing the value because your mass is reducing all the time. So the constant force engines will not work. So you need throttleable engines. So we had to build throttleable engines for the first time. So in Chandrayaan 2, we had built that and then we had characterized it on ground and based on the ground characterization the logic and algorithms were all used and we fell short of achieving our target by a small margin both because the target area where we were landing had a limited we had limited knowledge i'll touch upon that in a subsequent slide and then the amount of fuel we could carry was limited so because of this the robustness which you can build into the satellite or the lander was in some ways limited. So we also built mechanisms in this operation where we could learn all this. In fact, this one slide in a way gives you the complete picture of how between Chandrayaan 2 and Chandrayaan 3 we succeeded. See what happens when the Chandrayaan 3, the object lander lands is you are orbiting moon at a certain velocity, something like 1.6 kilometers per second. What is required to be done is at a particular instant of time, you start descending onto the surface of the moon. That means you need to reduce both the horizontal velocity. If you kill the horizontal velocity fully, object is like a free fall. Depending on the gravity of the moon, it will be pulled down. So if you don't want that pull down to happen, you have to give an exactly opposite thrust to the object. So you keep firing so you can remain at a constant point. So what this requires is you need to kill horizontal velocity and vertical velocity. And even as you do all this, you need to compute what is your current position at each instant of time. So at the end of a finite period of time, you come above what is called as a landing site location. And at that point, if you take a picture of the area and then if you have a reference image, you can compare between the picture what you have taken now and the reference image and decide how much you have to move laterally for touching down. So the task was like that. So obviously in Chandrayaan 2, the landing site information itself, what information we had was based on our Chandrayaan 1 data of 5 meter resolution. And for getting some high resolution data, we had to depend on other sources, Americans and Japanese, etc. Obviously, you don't get all the information you want. Whereas in Chandrayaan 3, what happened? We carried in Chandrayaan 2, one of the world's highest resolution imaging system called OHRC, with which we could take pictures of 25 to 30 centimeter resolution. So what we were able to do in Chandrayaan 3 is identify an area (coughs) which is four kilometers by two kilometers in size. And when you come above that, any 150 meter diameter you have a safe landing space with a movement less than 150 meter diameter so that means you had predetermined the landing area with such information gathered from chandrayaan 2 orbiter which worked between 2019 and 2023 so we had a much larger area where we could touch down with corresponding information for Chandrayaan 2 was only 500 meter and then the lateral movement requirement was also more there. So one is now your target area has become much larger. So now your starting point also you need to know very accurately because between the starting point and the end point all the information is happening based on what are called inertial sensors. They tell you relative. What is my relative velocity? If my position is X now, my new position I can calculate based on relative information. So if these sensors are not performing properly, they add to the errors. So not only your starting point error, but in the process of reaching that 700 odd kilometers, whatever errors you commit, 
will all get accumulated. So in Chandrayaan 2, we had only 500 meter margin. Whereas in Chandrayaan 3, we had 4 kilometer by 2 kilometer. So we had much larger error margin in the process of starting to end. Starting point itself, we were able to determine its position because we had become proficient in determining the orbits of the satellite orbiting the moon with our own ground station tracking and continuous evaluation. So starting point is known accurately, end point is known accurate with a larger margin. Then the intermediate algorithms what you are using, it is like how much resource you have. Suppose in your bank balance you have only 100 rupees and you want to conduct a function which is going to be very costly. You are going to cut corners everywhere and make it just happen. So the, your margin for errors and margin for unknown things are limited. Whereas in this case, we were also able to carry much more fuel. So we could carry more fuel and we could test all the systems on ground. And then even during the orbiting period also, the new engines, we validated their functioning by operating them in orbit so that everything was verified and validated. That's how Chandrayaan-3 mission could successfully deliver what was required. Okay, I think we'll go out. In. Okay. Is it a video? Yeah, it's a video. Okay. You can close it. If it's okay. Can go back to the yeah. this one. Right? This one. Oh, okay. from there okay somewhere in that is open yeah it is here it's failing one of the keys from there he was open yeah no, once we are opening it will come, so it as an icon. Which line? You go further down. Still. This can be played. Last slide, huh? yeah, Before that, uh, yeah. if this can be played, it will be nice. Otherwise, it's okay. No. Okay, go to the last slide. Exactly last line. Huh? Last but one. Mm. Okay, leave it. I think go to the last slide. Actually, on that slide, if you click, it should have worked. I mean, now directly we are going to the last okay. slide.
Okay, that video was about how the Chandrayaan-3, during the process of its realization, what kind of tests it had gone through. But anyway, I think there's some small problem in playing that. I'll move ahead. Yeah, these are some few quotes from uh, Vikram Sarabhai, which basically shows his approach. One of the thing he says is, the important ingredient for satisfactorily meeting the challenge of the changing environment is not an is not experience, but an ability to learn. This is in many ways very different from what most people tell you. In fact, what his idea was, it appears when he started running Atira, one advertisement he had put in the post in the paper saying those with experience need not apply. So what it means is the problem that you are facing and your ability to solve the problem requires a different outlook and you need not be bogged down by your experience. You need to look at it in a fresh mindset. So that if you look at it in the context of today's thing again, that many times we may give too much importance to experience, but as the things are changing rapidly, what worked yesterday need not work today or tomorrow. So that is a prime point. And he had even ex experimented such things during the course of his own activities. So it's very important to just note that whether you agree or don't agree, it doesn't matter, it's another perspective. So experience is less relevant than the knowledge and the ability to learn and innovate. So if you are ready to learn, you can learn new things. And if you innovate on that, you can make much more things happen. And this is definitely very relevant in today's uh, world. It's not going. Okay. So this is another very important aspect. Technology is not an objective to be aimed at, but a tool to be used for the benefit of common man. If, again, if you see what is or even many departments have shown, is that your ability to make use of the changing technology for addressing the problems we are facing, and that is more important than the developing the technology itself for the benefit of the common man. Okay, this is the last slide I have. Sarabhai's vision on the development of space technology and its exhaustive applic extensive application for the betterment of society continues to be the guiding light of the space program even today. Though many may think that doing manned programs and this is all going beyond, actually speaking, if you look at the way the world is changing, and if you have to remain relevant and also contemporary, you cannot but develop skills that are needed for you to be counted among the equals. Otherwise, you will again run the risk of being left behind and overtaken. So if that should not happen, space is one of the new frontiers, and human being is looking at how this particular ability of going to space can help him dominate, conquer, and out <laughs> outperform others. So in this context, our ability to comprehend space, learn from space about life, and not only sustaining life, and also making different things happen on Earth becomes very important. And that is where scientific institutions also have a huge role to play. Many times it may appear that what you are doing does not have any immediate relevance. But then, there again, we are wrong. The world has shown, the history has shown that it's only your knowledge and knowledge of things and continuous desire to know newer and newer things. What comes into reality tomorrow, you never know. For example, if you look at originally what human being was doing, he tried to develop tools to reduce his physical labor. So you built huge machines for reducing his labor. Then he has built very intelligent machines for reducing his intellectual capability being used. Being used in such a manner that 
without our idiosyncrasies of our emotions etc there are gadgets which can perform what human beings are doing and then already things are being built where humans and uh, machines are working together whether it's internet of things tomorrow it is internet of brains is what is being talked about and also looking at outer space beyond this world knowing the entire universe how it helps improving the way humans interact with each other what is in store we never know but then our desire to continuously learn new things and push the frontiers is what is essential and what institutions like this or even the place where we are sitting here what it has shown in the 1800s what was required for looking at sun and making observations and then it has made a huge impact in many ways but then today it is in our hands to see how we make use of today's technology and conceive of solutions to problems we are going to face tomorrow that's the real challenge so let me close here with uh, complimenting the director ia and all the members of uh, kodai canal observatory for giving me an opportunity to come here share with you some of the his stories of uh, isro and through that tell you some information which you might find useful thank you very much Thank you Shaker considerations etc but apart from that that was a even a better place than this because it provided that kind of an isolation and ability to work and now the other one whatever is being done now has a specific advantage because in shar when we want to do any polar orbiting satellite launch we have to do what is called as a dog leg maneuver because otherwise some of the stage dropouts can fall on sri lanka or nearby so we don't want such a thing to happen so you go away from that region and then change the direction and move so for this you have to spend extra fuel extra energy so when today you are trying to make use of uh, smaller and smaller launch vehicles providing you capability kulshekar patnam particularly for the polar orbiting satellites gives us a significant advantage that's why that is being done otherwise the ideal place would be at zero degree latitude and uh, ocean on one side would be a most ideal place because as you can visualize the spinning of the earth itself can add about 0.45 kilometers per second velocity to the object there yeah. any other question here yeah, yeah. Huh? yes sir uh, we have now established a very good relationship with nasa even from mangala jan starting everything are we exploring a similar collaborative effort with the years of the european space uh, yeah no, no in fact right from the early days we have been having collaboration with all the space agencies but then what actually happens in any collaboration depends on a whole lot of parameters while many might agree to do work with you depending on your capability what kind of work they want to do with you changes that's what i was trying to mention so even with nasa for example it was all initially one way and then a mission common mission they were doing with japan for europe your european section only after for example chandrayaan mars and our own sar systems they were ready to do a mission that's what i was mentioning but otherwise we have been right from the day one what we have done is see for example russians offered us free launch couple of launches so we made use of that opportunity to build satellites the first aryabhata after that baskara was in that category similarly european space agency and the europeans when they were building their arian launch vehicle in their very first launch they said we are ready to put a satellite of yours if you are ready to take the risk so because it's the first developmental flight not many are ready to take that risk but for us it was an opportunity we built the first three axis stabilized satellite called apple using that opportunity and day and then later also european space agency lot of interaction etc happens so russians 
German, yeah. French, French, we had a couple of programs. So it's always uh, ready to do, but then what actually happens depends on a whole lot of other parameters. Gopal has a question. Yes, Excellent talk, thank you very much. So I have a slightly different question uh, about partnership, and that is uh, uh, partnership with private companies. A couple of years ago, uh, in IIT Madras, they organized a uh, uh, space entrepreneurship uh, workshop, and they happened to be heading a group and very interesting experience. Uh, there are many startup companies uh, in India, in the Asia region, and in the US as well. And uh, we recently had this uh, commercial lunar payload services program. And a private company built a lander, used SpaceX, and uh, funded by NASA. But they did land on the moon. You probably yeah, correct. Okay. It was in February 15th uh, they launched. So, so it looks like uh, things can be much cheaper uh, if, you, if you can have a partnership with uh, private industry. So what is the... Uh, yeah, in fact, in this also, the India has moved very quickly. See, today, like in the earlier era, it was only the nation states which were doing space activities. After Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and many of them, the world has changed. What India also is doing is, it is no longer just the government agencies which is doing the space activities. So it wants larger, and for a country which had developed the space technology, should it be not a part of the trillion dollar space economy? And if you are also aspiring to become, go up the ladder in the economy, one of the key areas where there is money should be enabled. So the government has already made significant changes, both in terms of policy and enabling environment. Today I've already seen that there is an entity called InSpace, which is promoting the development of space activities in the country in multi ways. One is it's also providing the facilities that the department or the government of India has set up, making those facilities accessible to entrepreneurs for carrying out tests. For example, Agnico, Skyroads, and many of them are testing their engines in the facility in ISRO, and they are also providing space for setting up their own launch pad. So this is on one side, and also how things are moving fast. If you see a company which is producing a 3D printed engine, has done the 3D printing far ahead of what we ourselves have done in ISRO. So ISRO is still, like many times you saw that what Sarabha had said, experience. So many times if you say you adopt a new technology and come out, we will have hundreds of people telling this will not work, that will not work. <laughs> but the private enterprise has already built a 3D printed engine and is moving. Now coming back to your point, so now InSpace is promoting this and is also providing opportunity to academic institution. In fact, uh, just uh, two weeks from now in Ahmedabad, there is going to one of the competitions which was set up on CANSAT. 100 academic institutions in the country were thrown a challenge. 32 of them have been selected. They have done their 3D printed satellites and these satellites will be dropped from a height of 500 meters. And as they come down, each unit or each entity has to demonstrate receiving signals from that, parachutes opening up and safely landing. So that competition is happening. IIT Jodhpur, I, many IITs, student groups are making this. So this is another area where things are moving. And also competitions where such things can be hosted in our platform. There is a platform we call as POEM. The fourth stage is a launch vehicle. Instead of simply orbiting and coming back, we are using it by providing energy and communication system and even three axis stabilizing in a fairly coarse way, providing them as opportunity for student satellites or even private enterprise concept. In fact, here, Plasma Thruster, one of the company Bellatrix, had put their component in the last uh, uh, poem mission and then verified. So now India is trying to provide its uh, citizens, entrepreneurs and academic institution an enabling environment where they can do whatever new developments or very different developments than what the organizations like ours also is looking at and supporting them. But in any new such endeavor, you appreciate that what happens depends on the people who participate. 
it is their drive and it is their energy which changes the thing things are set in place now how it plays out we will see in the coming years what is expected is india capturing at least 20% of the global space economy Yeah, go ahead. Similar question. Uh, Regarding the, you, you the Israel has allowed the private industry uh, for the space, uh, the question is because so the Israel uh, is the main thing, that's what I understand, uh, the ultimately the societal benefits. Do you think that if one allows for the private space industry, uh, they will uh, ultimately lead to societal benefits or only for profit like you know, corporates. Okay, I think here is again what we need to appreciate is a lot of things which are started initially have a potential to become commercially viable for operation. If you look at communication itself, the communication today is a completely commercially viable activity. So many private enterprise is getting into that. But then the other thing that happens is private enterprise is also in a position to do bring in resources when they think at some point in time they can get returns which can actually outperform or uh, outweigh what investment they have done. So this is one thing which can happen from that. So one of the ideas of the government is also in all those areas where private enterprise can do like that, we need not spend money and sustain such activity. But obviously, there is a sort of a trade-off which happens. And sometimes people do get into problem. Even in US, the Earth observation was initially thought that it can all become private enterprise-driven activity. So they stopped for some time. They went into difficulties. And in fact, even our own images were taken by some of the agencies for supporting. But now, the things are changing. So anyway, these kinds of things will continue to happen. There will be a balancing act between the government. Government definitely is driven by how it can enable India to gain in all those economy activities and then improve on its own technological capability. So instead of only limited number of people within the government organizations participating in this, how to make it happen in a much larger thing. In this process, of course, you will see some slowdown in certain activities, but then very soon the corrections will happen, it will change. But I don't think there is any ambiguity on what the government is trying to do. It is trying to make sure that globally, if people are, for example, today, there are companies which are trying to build space station on their own. Why? Because manufacturing there can give them benefits in certain medicine to billions of dollars. So they are ready to invest and make their own space station. So a whole lot of that space adventure, space tourism, a lot of things are there. So India also similar thing will happen. So between the next few years, how things shape up will show what the government needs to know. But at the same time, government always has the responsibility of providing essential things if it doesn't happen through the private operation. So it will pitch in and come back. One last question from here. Yeah. yeah, thank you, sir, for a very informative talk on space technology. So I have a slightly different question. So now that ISRO is venturing into these observation of astronomy, astrophysics, and you know the sciences, so are there any plans to also develop computational facilities uh, for, for in ISRO? You know, for example, like NASA has its own facilities. So what what is your take on you know what should ISRO do about? A and a computation. Okay, no, actually if you look at one of the things that is happening in this is today the world is moving at such a pace where high performance computing or even cloud etc etc if you see the effort the government wants to tell we don't want to invest. We want to pay you only as a service charge. So that is a general approach. So if you can make use of what is established elsewhere and do whatever you want to do, no problem, even if it is costlier as a service, we will we are ready to support you. But if you ask for installation, maintenance and running that, 
it is not for that but anyway notwithstanding that point even as, during the course of your own activities many such facilities do get established high performance computing systems and making it available for analysis of various data whether it is for ai ml related activities for example today many centers are setting up some high performance computing systems and so this will continue but to what level it will go is a question mark but primarily the objective will be how can we take the resources that is available and use that resources for whatever we want to do there is no restriction put on your requirement of how much service charge you want to pay them but don't ask the original setup to be installed because that brings in lot of people who are required to maintain and run and then they become after a certain period of time in a way unproductive so that's what the governments want to avoid but is this is that a correct solution nobody can answer shall we quickly check if there are any questions from the yeah. IA auditorium or in zoom are there any questions from my auditorium no so uh thank you very much sir for uh, handling let's thank the speaker again and uh, apologies for not being able to yeah, <laughs> present yeah. your presentation very well so we will uh, i request uh, uh, professor anupuri subramanian to